Good evening, and thank you for joining us for part two of our four-part series at BRS on how to break bad habits and forge good habits. This series, uh, all delivered by rabbis of BRS, is all about recognizing that if we want to grow spiritually, if we want to be the best version of ourselves in terms of our neshama, of our soul, then we need to be disciplined, we need to be in control, we need to be healthy when it comes to our body. We need to be able to breathe right, breathing, Neshama and Neshima are the same word. Last week, Rabbi Moskowitz spoke about the importance of the breath of life, of breathing, not in a shallow way, not in a rushed way, but to be conscious of our breathing and to breathe deeply and breathe meaningfully. Tonight, we'll speak about eating, the Jewish philosophy of eating. What is our attitude? What is our approach? What is the role of food in our religion? How can we be more mindful in what we eat and how we eat and how much we eat and when we eat? How can food become the fuel that elevates us and enriches us, that drives us to a better version of ourselves instead of food becoming a phobia, instead of food becoming the kryptonite, instead of food becoming that which sabotages our own happiness and success. Third session will be about sleep. How do we get enough sleep? Are we resting? Are we rejuvenating? Are we allowing ourselves to sleep? And lastly, movement. Are we exercising? Are we sedentary and still? One of the greatest causes of death in America? Or are we moving? Are we on the move? Are we people who are holech or omed? Are we moving or are we standing still? So tonight's topic, our topic is that of eating. An attitude, a philosophy, an approach to the notion of eating. Now on the one hand, we know that eating, we know that eating can be a source of, uh, a source of struggle, a source of conflict. Eating can be a source of illness, a source of unhealthiness. People who eat the wrong amounts, the wrong time, the wrong things, it can undermine. So it'd be very easy to simply dismiss and say that the Jewish approach to eating is that if we want to, if we aspire for holiness, if we aspire for Kedusha and Tahara, we want to life, live a life of purity, that we should take vows of, of fasting, that a person should abstain from eating, that the way we become holy is by removing ourselves from food. But we know that that can't be because food, the act of eating has a mila. There is a virtue. And how do we know that there's a virtue and a value to the act of eating? Because with every Indian chashiv, with every significant life cycle event, with every significant date on our Jewish calendar, with every significant ritual, there is a mitzvah, there is a commandment to eat. Shabbos, we have Shabbos food, so the Shabbos we eat. Mo'adin yantif, ein simcha ela basar We have a mitzvah to eat, we have a mitzvah to indulge to a certain extent when it comes to yantif. So this mitzvah, we celebrate the siyam, a completion, a significant amount of Torah learning. We celebrate a bris, a pidyon ben, a bar mitzvah, a bas mitzvah. There is a notion of eating to celebrate that sudas mitzvah, a wedding, a sheva brachas, the korbanos and the beis hamikdash. They were eaten. Some were offered entirely to the Almighty, to Hashem, eaten, so to say, mishulchan gavoa on his table. But others, the kohen and the priests themselves, partook. The owners of certain korbanos partook in the food, the carbon, the sacrifice that was offered. So on the one hand, food can bring us down. Food can compromise. Food is to indulge the animal side, to eat like a pig, and to indulge the animal instinct inside us. Food is the capacity to be metamtein as We know certainly the Ramban brings when it comes to non-kosher food, it contaminates the heart, it contaminates the soul. We believe to a certain extent you are what you eat. If we eat animals of prey, animals of cruelty, we absorb those qualities, we absorb those character traits into ourselves. So food can give us a urida, overindulging in food, being undisciplined in our eating. Food can make us unhealthy. Eating the wrong foods, non-kosher foods, can contaminate our soul. And yet, on the other hand, food elevates. And food has a role, food has a presence in all of these other heightens. So this mitzvah, Shabbos, Yantif, and uh, the examples go on and on. So which is it? Is food bad? Is food good? Does food lower us down? Or does food raise us up? Is food the platform or the source of a mitzvah or of an avera? And of course, the answer is all the above. The answer is both. It has to do with our attitude. It has to do with our philosophy. It has to do with an approach. Now, I don't even need to give this disclaimer. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not even an example of good eating. I've been involved and engaged in a lifelong battle and struggle. I'm not one of those people who has no interest in food, no need for food. I have to struggle to remember to eat. That's not me. Halavai, in some ways it were. I love food. I love the taste. I love the texture. I love the aroma. I love the mix of flavors. I'm a foodie. I love food. And it's easy to lose ourselves in the urge, the instinct of the stomach, that our eyes 
are wide and our mouth is open and that we desire and we want to eat and we want to indulge and we want to enjoy late at night and early in the morning in enormous quantities, even when we're full. So I'm speaking to you as a member of the club, not a person on the outside who's mastered this, not a nutritionist who's coming to give you menus and recipes. I'm coming as a Rav, I'm coming as a rabbi. I want to share with you some Torah sources, share with us, be machazig myself to remember how we can be mindful, how we can be conscientious, how we can be present and intentional in choosing what we eat, when we eat, how much we eat. And doing so is not just about the physical world in which we live. Doing so is an avoda. Doing so is part of what it means to aspire to be a holy Jew and to live a holy life. Parshas Kiseitze, we just read, Torah tells us the story of the Ben Sora Umora, the rebellious child, the rebellious son, who acts inconsistent with the philosophy, the values that his parents have imparted in him, that his teachers have tried to communicate to him. And in that context, when the Torah is describing to us this wayward son, they, the parents, come to the elders of the town, and when they are presenting and when they are describing their son who's a ben sorer umore, they say, this son of ours, he's sorer umore, he's disloyal, he's defiant, he suffers from defiance, he counter everything that we say. He doesn't listen to us. in He's not listening to our voice, he's not heeding our message, he's not walking in our path. And then the parents conclude their presentation, their indictment, so to say, of their own son, and they describe their son as being zolel visove. What do those words mean? Zolel means a glutton. Sove means a drunkard. He is zolel visove. What does that mean? What makes this behavior so unforgivable? What makes this behavior so predictable? Meaning that the Ben Soro Umora has not yet murdered, has not yet done a capital crime, and yet the Ben Soro Umora this theoretical individual, this hypothetical character has to be eliminated from the community. I'll shame Sofo because we know what they're destined to do, even though they haven't done it yet. What gives us that confidence to predict how their story will end so much so that we take their destiny into our own hands? So the Ibn Ezra translates the word zolel as gluttonous, somebody who permits himself or herself whatever he or she desires. And in fact, the Gemara in Sanhedrin Daf Ayin tells us that in this context, when the parents come and say, our son, he's incorrigible, he's rebellious, he won't listen, there's nothing we can do. What is his egregious crime? What are the boundaries that he crosses and will not remain within, says the Gemara Sanhedrin Daf Ayin? Food. Zolel visove. Zolel is his gluttonous. He eats an entire bag of potato chips. He makes his way through the entire kitchen, the entire refrigerator, the entire pantry, the entire schmorg, the entire the entire buffet. Zolel is gluttonous. He grabs and he stuffs down his down his uh, down his throat. What is sove? What's the other crime? So listen to the Ibn Ezra. Ibn Ezra says Zolel the sove. Sove is someone who drinks excessively to the extent they get drunk. And such a person writes that the Ibn Ezra resembles a follower of Epicurus, an Epicurean, because he seeks from life in this world only pleasure. Zolel v'sove, just indulging, just trying to satisfy the urge for that moment. No discipline, no self-control, no capacity to be roas anolad. If I eat that, if I eat it now, if I eat that amount, what will impact will it have? How will I feel? What will it do to my health? We cannot allow this ben sora umora, we don't allow this wayward son to just carry on. But since when is having this voracious, undisciplined appetite a capital crime? Zolel v'sove. Why does that give us the confidence to predict Ashim Sofa what's going to happen? There are many, many worse violations. Why Zolel v'sove? Gluttonous, overindulgent, stuffing his face with food, getting drunk with alcohol. Why is this chosen to highlight what's irredeemable about this young person? Rav Hirsch is bothered by this question. He offers a critically important answer and insight. We know that the Gemara tells us there never was, there never will be this whole individual this whole description of the Bensora Umora is in theory, not in practice. So why does the Torah take up special precious real estate telling us about him if he was never destined to exist? So that same Gemara, Sanhedrin Davayin, tells us, Drosh the Kabbalschar. We've been given these lessons to study and receive reward. I know this is last week's Pasha, but listen to this insight and listen to its message for us and our attitude towards eating. It says Rav Hirsch, Though legally we've never formally established an actual case of a Ben Sora Umora, but the lessons, the insights, they remain. And we can glean from them, we can extract, we can extrapolate from them, and we can learn from them. Says Rav Hirsch, the central to the downfall of the Ben Sora Umora is growing up in a home 
that place disproportionate emphasis and focus on food and drink, on the pursuit of pleasure and on the goal of satisfying appetites and cravings. Have to have, have to have these delicacies, have to have this diversity, this menu, have to have this expensive alcohol collection, wine, scotch, rye, bourbon, vodka, tequila, the latest thing, have to have sushi stations, charcuterie boards, endless endless buffets and barbecues. There's nothing wrong with wonderful, delicious delicacies. I told you I love food. I enjoy it as much as the next person. And to a certain degree, the more we have, the more we share, the more it glorifies, the more it elevates our Shabbos, our Yontif table, a menu with a variety of courses and mains and sides and desserts. It can, of course, add the covered Shabbos, the covered Yontif. It can add to the honor. It can add to the glory. One can even, within moderation, enjoy a glass of wine, make a l'chaim in moderation and responsibly. The question is, fundamentally, what defines us? Are we disciplined? Are we in control? Do we choose? Do we own it? Or does it own us? What defines the look of that Shabbos table, of that Yontif table? Where do we place our emphasis? What are we most proud of? The atmosphere, the love, the warmth, the conversation, the generosity, the hospitality, the Torah, the Zmiros, or the expense? and the menu, and the decor, and so on and so forth. So, Zolel Vesove, this individual who grows up in such a home, this individual who exhibits this insatiable appetite for more, this lack of discipline or boundaries, this lack of capacity, this individual, when you're Zolel Vesove, you're striving for happiness. But Judaism wants us to strive instead for holiness, not just for pleasure, not just to satisfy the appetite of this of the body, but to nourish the appetite of the soul. This is what it means, zolel v'sove, zolel v'sove. A person is a slave, a slave to their, to their stomach, to their appetite, seldom worships God. So we have to work on this arena, arguably as much or more than any other. The Zohar HaKadosh, the Hilaga, the great mystical work of Judaism, the Zohar, tells us that at every table and every encounter with food, at every urge of the appetite, there's a melchama, there's a war, there's a battle that rages. The animal instinct inside us says, you're hungry, eat, you're full, who cares? It still tastes good, your taste buds are still being satisfied, keep eating, keep shoveling, keep putting it in. Have no, pay no attention to how full you feel. Pay no attention to the ingredients of the manufacturing process. Pay no attention to its impact on your cholesterol, on your sugar level, on your blood pressure and the like. It tastes good. It feels good. At that moment, there's an appetite. There's a desire. There's a drive. Shovel it in. Indulge. And so we fight a battle. We fight a war. And that's why the Zohar says the Hebrew word for bread is lechem. Lechem shares the same root as milchama, lochem. A lochem is a fighter, is a warrior. Lachem is to, to, the verb is to fight, is to battle. Lechem is bread, Milchama is war. What are they all in common? Why does the Zohar reference this? It says Rav Hirsch here too, that Lamed Ches Mem, the root, the Shorish, Lamed Ches Mem means to struggle. There's a struggle. In war, in battle, there's a struggle between two contradicting, two conflicting forces. And when we sit in front of food, when we look at a menu, when we have an appetite and a desire, there's also a battle. There's a struggle. There's a mochamo. Says refresh most fundamentally, when it comes to food, the battle, that root, lamed ches mem, that battle is to earn parnasa. A person has to toil. A person has to work. A person has to sacrifice. A person has to put in hours. A person in antiquity had to put in backbreaking labor. A person had to battle and struggle just to earn the food they ate. But it also has the additional meaning. Not only, not only the battle to earn the food we eat, but the battle to eat the right food in the right time, at the right place, the right amounts, and the right food. With food, there is a struggle. There is a battle. There is a conflict which takes place. And that's why Rav Tzadik Akoin of Lublin, the great Rav Tzadik in Pashat Mishpatan, tells us that David HaMelech, when David HaMelech in Telem Chav Gimel, Mizmo David, Hashem Ro'ilo Achzar, Hashem, you are my shepherd, I'm not lacking. When I see your role in my life, I'm not missing anything. Everything I have is by design, is what's meant for me, and I'm therefore satisfied. And we turn to Hashem, we say, Taruch lefanai shulchan, neged sorerai. Make for me, set for me, arrange for me a table opposite my adversaries. Neged sorerai. And says the Heliger of Tzadik HaKoyin of Lublin, who are the neged sorerai? Who is this enemy that I'm facing? Taruch lefanai shulchan. When I sit at that table, I see the appetizer. 
second appetizer. The three mains, the 14 side dishes, the seven desserts, I am neged sorerai. It's, it's, it's when I'm shulchan, tarach lafanai shulchan, when I'm at that shulchan, when I'm at that table, when I see that food, I'm neged sorerai. Kodesh Baruch Hu put us in a world, and that's what I want to spend our time talking about tonight. Why? Why did he put us in a world in this way? Why couldn't he program or design us to only crave and desire what's healthy for us? Why would he not shut down our appetite? Why would he not shut down our ability to eat once we were full? Why not when our stomach has what it needs, our mouth be closed? Why did he put us in such a world that has this milchama, lechem, that when it comes to food, we have to fight. We have to fight to do what's right, to eat what's right, to stay healthy, and to be able to live for holiness, not happiness. Why is it, Taruch Lefanai Shulchan, why is it that when we sit at our table, we see those options, when those when the, the food is still sitting there, you know, in Boca Raton, it's very popular in Shabbos and Yontif to serve buffet. Put all the food out on a buffet and people go and they help themselves. And it's a much healthier when the food sits there and you have the endless Shabbos meals and you're talking, even though you're not hungry, you put a little bit more on your plate. You nibble, you eat, you finish, you clean up, you do the host to host us a favor. Then why should you have to put away the last two pieces of meat? Why should you have to put away the last three pieces of kugel? Let me finish them. Let me help you out. When you put it on a buffet, you're healthier. So taruch lefanai shulchan. When it's on the shulchan, when I sit down and I see that food and I see the serving sizes and I see the serving dishes and I see the selection and I see the diversity of the menu, I'm negative. So right, I'm opposite. Why? Why did he create a world like this? Why did he create a world like this? So the Gemara tells us that ain kiddush. Ella b'makom se'uda. That halachic principle, the 10th parak of Arve Psachim, Gemara tells us, the Mishnah tells us, Ein Kiddush Ella b'makom se'uda. That when we recite Kiddush on Shabbos and Yantif, you can't just make Kiddush. In order for the Kiddush, to machlok is Rashbam and Tosfos, tonight is not the time for the lumdus for the deeper analysis, but it's perhaps the Kiddush you say is not a real Kiddush if it doesn't introduce and precede a meal. Or maybe the meal is not a real meal if it's not introduced first by saying Kiddush. Different ways you can understand it. But either way, the Kiddush that you recite has to be accompanied by, it has to precede, it has to follow by a meal. But many suggest that we read these words not only as giving us a halachic statement, it's not only telling us something in practice we need to do, but it's telling us a philosophy. Ain Kiddush, Ain Kiddusha, Ella b'makam Suda. The self-restraint the capacity to be disciplined, the ability to control ourselves, to be God-like, is b'makam se'uda. We have to protect our eyes. We're not allowed to gaze. We're not allowed to look at the things we're not supposed to look at. We have to protect our mouth. We're not supposed to speak or share or gossip or slander things we're not supposed to share. We have to protect our hands and our feet. We're not supposed to go. We're not supposed to engage in actions and acting out in ways we're not supposed to. But you know where the greatest battle is? For many, it's in food. It's in food. And all you have to do is look around this country and look around the world today, the rising levels of obesity, the amount of people who are taking medicines that if we controlled our diet and we lived healthy lives, we wouldn't need. And again, I'm a member of the club. I've been struggling my entire life and I struggle each and every day. Don't eat late at night. Don't finish the entire bag of potato chips. Stop eating when you're full. And this Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Almighty created us with this appetite and put us in a world that functions in this way because He wants us to have a platform for making choices. When we are pre-programmed, if everything was fatalistic, if we were designed to do what's right and we made no choices, life would not have meaning. What gives life its very meaning are the choices that we make. And choices only have meaning and they're only in fact real choices when we confront the choice to do the opposite of what's right. When we have a distraction, a desire, a temptation, when we confront inertia, that's when making the right choice, in fact, elevates us and enriches us. Ain Kiddush, you want Kiddusha, you want holiness? It's B'makam Suda. Kiddusha, ain Kiddusha el B'makam Suda. We really attain holiness where? B'makam Suda, in the place that we eat. That's when we attain holiness. That's when we attain the highest levels. The Chidor, the Chaim Yosef, David Azulay, and the Sefer, Chomas Anach, writes that the word Shulchan, Tarach Lafanai Shulchan, the word Shulchan in Gematria is 388. 388 is the same gematria, same numerical value as La Mashiach. You want redemption? Redemption comes from living a disciplined, godly life. God is the ultimate in discipline. God doesn't have desires. God doesn't give in to impulse. God doesn't indulge in instinct. God is not animal-like in any which way. God is the very definition of discipline. And for us, the Tzalem Elohim, the godliness in us, the more disciplined we are, the more godly we are. The more punctual we are with time, the more disciplined we are with what we look at, the more disciplined we are with what we speak and what we say, what we do, where we go, and the more disciplined we are in our eating. It is the very way we express our very godliness. 
an animal, we are all made up of animals. Chazal, our rabbis tell us we have several things in common with animals. We eat, we eliminate, we reproduce just like animals do. We have an animal instinct, an animal desire, an animal drive. And that enters our vernacular. A person eats like an animal. They live in a pigsty. We are animals, but we also have a godly soul. And that's his battle. That fight, that milchama, the lechem that we confront our entire lives, that battle is the battle. What will triumph and what will win? What will persevere? Will it be the instinct, the impulse, the desire, the drive to look at the thing that we feel guilty afterwards, to say the thing we feel terrible that we said, to go to the place that we regret going to and to eat that which is harmful and sabotages our own health? Are we going to give in to the animal in us or will we live that discipline? Will we be that godly soul? That battle, that fight is a lifelong battle. In fact, back in Parshas Matos, when the Jewish people, the Jewish people wage war with Midian, and the Pasuk tells us, Vayomer Elazar HaKohen al Tzava Habaim Lamilchama. Elazar HaKohen, Aaron's son, addresses the members of the army who come back from war. And the Torah says, they're Baim, they are returning, they are coming back from Lamilchama. What should it say? It's a bizarre formulation. What do you mean they're coming back? La milchama. What should it say? Not li milchama. They're coming back. They're coming back. Me milchama. They're coming back from war. So they say from Mayana Shal Torah, that beautiful white set many people get for their bar mitzvah, sits in the bookcase, it gathers dust. Of Alexander Zush Friedman, who's murdered by the Nazis, Yimach Shemam, Vizachram, and he has this beautiful say from Mayana Shal Torah. So he asks, why does the Pasuk say, Anshea Tzavah Habaim la milchama? The people of the war who are coming back to war, it should say habaim meha milchama. They're coming back from war. So he answers something very powerful. And he says that fight, that battle with Midian, it wasn't easy. They had to gird themselves, they had to prepare themselves, they had to focus themselves, and they had to have the courage to confront Midian and to defeat them. It wasn't easy at all. But you know, those soldiers, they're done with war. They come home and they think, I'm finished, I'm complete. That was the battleground. That was the battlefront. That was the front line. And now we're done. We triumphed. We persevered. We're coming home, says the Torah. They're ba'im lim You finished one battle, but the war is not over. You came home from fighting external enemy, namely Midian. But life, life is a lifelong battle. We confront a lifelong enemy. That's not external, but it's internal. And that's why they are ba'im lim They're not coming from war. They're going to war from the war with Midian, from the battlefield with Midian, to the battlefield of our kitchen and the supermarkets and the restaurants, to the battlefield of the snacks and the appetite and the eating, to the battle of not only when it comes to the act of eating, but all of our instinct and all of our senses and all of our impulses to do the right thing, to remain mindful and present, to express our godliness and to be able to realize a better or best version of ourselves. Rabbeinu Yonah, the great Rishon Rabbeinu Yonah, and his Yisoda Tshuva, he quotes the Ravid, the Ravid was a the the um, contemporary of the Rambam, and the Ravid had a personal practice that he used in order to quiet his appetite. He had a personal practice he used in order to grow his discipline. The Ravid would leave over the last few bites of everything he ate. This is known as Tainus Haravid, the fast of the Ravid. He didn't fast. We don't believe in fasting. Hashem put us in the world and he gave us taste buds and he gave us delicious food. God forbid those who suffered from Corona, many lost their sense of taste. And now they can appreciate all their lives the gift of having it, that when you put food on your tongue, you can taste it. Sweet, savory, the whole palate of our tastes. What a gift, what a bracha. Never take it for granted. Every time we taste, we should be appreciative to the Ribbon Shalom, to the Almighty for that, for that gift. So the Ravid, he didn't fast altogether. He didn't go on prolonged fasts, but rather he underwent, he engaged Tainus HaRavid. What was the Tainus HaRavid? He would not eat everything on his plate. He would leave over a little extra. The whole sandwich, he wouldn't take the last bite. The whole kugel, the whole piece of chicken, whatever was on his plate, he did not finish till the very end. He didn't lick his plate. He didn't go back for more. He left over a little later. Why? Tainus arrived. The Rabbeinu Yonah quotes this in his Hatshuva. Because the Ravid wanted to show that he was expressing his godliness, his godly soul, his godly spirit. He wanted to express to Hashem and to himself and to anyone who might notice that he might have an appetite like every other human being who has an animal instinct but he wasn't going to give in. He was not going to succumb, surrender to that animal impulse. He was going to express the godliness that we don't have to finish every last morsel, that the restaurant hasn't, doesn't determine for us the portion that we need when we're full stop eating. Just because the restaurant decided that that's the portion doesn't mean it is the actual healthiest portion for ourselves. 800 years after the Ravid, 
Ravana Kotler Zatzal, his students noticed he also left over a portion of whatever he ate or drank. And when asked, it became clear that he was observing this practice of the Ravid, the Tainus HaRavid, living disciplined lives, being godly, not acting like animals. Ah, oh, you'll ask, isn't it Baltashchus? The Ravid left over on his plate? They threw away the scraps? He didn't finish eating everything that was there? What do you mean? Isn't that Baltashchus? Isn't that waste? We have a Torah prohibition. You're not allowed to throw away food. You're not allowed to waste it. So listen to this amazing comment by Rav Nachman of Breslov. Eligar of Nachman of Breslov's Likute Muharan. He writes the following. On the Pasuk, V'yachalta anavim kenafshecha savecha v'yachel yecha l'titein. He writes the following. Listen to his words. Kesha'ochel yoser mitzorcho. Zamacho maziklo. When you eat more than you need, when you're already full, but you keep on eating anyway, that food is damaging you. That food is dangerous for you. It's unhealthy for you. That food is an enemy that's sabotaging you. Because everything has, we're going to get to this in a moment, but everything has a root, as a source, which is our life source. When it comes to medicine, when it comes to chemicals, when they are mixed in a way that can preserve and protect our health in the form of a, of a vaccine, the medicines we take, antibiotics and others, in order to heal illness, Food is like a medicine. The food gives us the nourishment. The food is our life source. It has a goodness in it. However, however, but if you're eating more than you need, so now this food has no place to nourish. You are already full. You've maxed out your capacity to be nourished from food. Now when you're indulging, when you're overeating, when you're eating, when you're not hungry, now not only is it not extending your life, nourishing your life is not a source of life, now it is exactly the opposite. And listen to the words of Nachman Breslov. He says, If you took a little bit more food, so you ate half the food, and it's what you needed. It had nutrients and vitamins. It sustained you. It nourished you. It gave you life. It brought you back to life. It gives you vitality. But what if you took the rest of the food and you put it in a bowl, you put it in the Tupperware, you put it in a Ziploc bag, you put it in an aluminum foil? Would that do anything for you at that point? Would it still be nourishing you or helping you? Absolutely not. It would be doing nothing. It would be worse than putting it in an aluminum foil, a Ziploc bag, or a piece of Tupperware. It would actually be damaging and harming you. But says Rav Nachman Abreslov, when you put food in your system, when you're already full, when you put the wrong food in your system that will harm you and not help you, then it's like putting it into a garbage pail. It's like putting it into the garbage pail. When you put that food into your system, when you're already full, you might as well put it in Tupperware. You might as well put it in a loom form. You might as well put it in the garbage. Is it Batashla's time to arrive at around Cutler to leave over a little bit, to be disciplined, to show I don't have to lick my plate. I don't have to finish the whole portion that was predetermined by the restaurant, even though it's twice what I need to do so. is not Batashla's. You're not wasting. You know, it's not only Batashla's when you put food in the garbage. It's Batashla's when you put food in your mouth and you don't need it. Your mouth can be a garbage disposal. If you're already full and you're eating food you don't need or it's harmful to you, then your mouth is functioning as a garbage disposal. So what we need is mindful eating. The Torah philosophy, the Torah attitude, the Torah approach to food is mindful eating, is eating food in a way which expresses and reinforces our godly soul. Kodesh Baruch Hu put us in this world and he said, enjoy my kinder, enjoy my children. I gave delicious food as long as you're eating kosher food and you're eating it on the right time, in the right way, according to halacha, as long as you acknowledge me in that role of food, enjoy. But when you have left the boundary, when you've crossed that border, when you're eating quantities and you're eating types and you're eating food that's unhealthy, then food is an animal. So we are engaged in this battle every single day from when we wake up till we fall asleep, from when we're hungry first thing in the morning to we're still tempted to snack late at night. It is a battle. And my friends, it's very clear. If you look around, you'll see we're losing this battle. So many people are eating and acting like animals. And we're shortening our life and we are harming ourselves. We're helping the drug industry, but we're hurting ourselves. The obesity crisis the childhood obesity crisis in this country because we're so undisciplined in our eating, because we're giving in. I know there are people, it's their metabolism, and there are people genetically predisposed, and we're not judging anyone who struggles in this area. Chalila, God forbid, it's not a comment or statement of judgment. There are people who it is beyond their bechira, it's beyond their choice. But healthy eating begins by remembering that we have, we have free will. 
And with free will comes the capacity for willpower. Why? Because we have a Tzalem Elohim. We are and we have a godly soul inside us. Don't submit. Don't surrender. Don't forfeit. Don't concede. Don't lose in this battle and this lifelong war. And therefore, shorten. You know, sometimes when I look at that food that's tempting me or I'm looking to eat a time of the day that I know will be bad for me, I don't think about that moment. I try to transcend that particular moment, that particular appetite, that particular urge, and to think haroa es hanolad, and to say, I want to be able to get on the floor and play with my grandchildren and great-grandchildren for many, many years. I want to be healthy for myself, and I want to be healthy for what I think is my mission in this world. And if I put that poison in my system, then my system cannot operate at maximum efficiency. And I have a responsibility. If I'm here for a reason, and if I have a mission in this world, and if I'm meant to make a difference, then I need to operate at maximum efficiency. Now, maximum efficiency can include having a cheat day. It happens to be fascinating. There are many nutritionists, there are diet experts who write about the significance of taking a day to cheat. Arguably, we have it. It's called Shabbos. Even if you go all week long and you don't eat carbs, I try not to make a mazonas or a mozi all week long. I've been working hard this summer and beyond to avoid the carbs, the white flour, to avoid the sugar. That, for me, is the biggest kryptonite. It's the most unhealthy. So I try... This is a helpful way to think about it. Don't make a mazonas. Don't make a mazonas or a hamotzi all week long. But then Shabbos comes. It's impossible. For me, it would be impossible to pledge a lifestyle that I'll never enjoy a mazonas. I'll never enjoy a carb. I'll never enjoy white flour, sugar again. It's impossible to concede, to believe. So there are experts who say you can build in a cheat day. Building a cheat day actually confuses your metabolism and is healthy for your metabolism in that way. Your metabolism adjusts too much. It can actually not be working in your favor. So sometimes confusing the metabolism can be healthy, just like you have to be ma'arvis a sutton. You have to confuse the sutton. We confuse the metabolism. But moreover, the fact that we know that we'll be able to have what we can call a cheat day, an indulgent day, can give us the courage and the fortitude to behave the rest of the week. As I said, I'm not a nutritionist and you're not here for my dietary recommendations. But the Jewish philosophy, the Jewish attitude is that when it comes to eating, I need to operate with maximum efficiency. I need to be the most productive me I can be. I owe it to myself and I owe it to my family and I owe it to this world and I owe it to the Rebona Shalom who gifted me and granted me the blessing to be here, to include me in this beautiful world that he created. I have a responsibility and I have to be careful what I put in my system. When you go for an oil change and you get a choice, what quality oil do you want? Depending on your engine engine, and depending how clean you want it to be and how efficient you want it to run. And every time we eat, we are facing a choice. What do I want to put in my system? How efficient do I want to run? If I eat late at night and I sleep the entire night with my stomach full with garbage, what will it do for the way I wake up in the morning? What will it do for my productivity? What will it do for my capacity to make a difference? But if I'm disciplined, eat, enjoy, enjoy a good flavor profile, Make good choices, have them delicious, but stop when you're full. Stop when you shouldn't be eating and stop and stop the quantity that is beyond what you need. The Me'iri, the Gemara of Orozara Dafayin Hay, the Me'iri of Menachem Me'iri makes an amazing comment, the great Rishon, and he says the following. We know that we have a lacha called Tefilas Kalim. When we fought that war, that battle with Midian, and we conquered them, they defeated them, we took, as part of the spoils, we took all their kitchen appliances. We took their utensils. Who needs to register at Fortunoff or Bed Bath and Beyond? We simply went into Midian, and when we won, we took everything in their kitchen. It needed to be kosher. The Torah tells us there in Parshas Matos, the process, the procedure for how we kosher. It needed to be kosher, turned from non-kosher to kosher. But it also needed tefillah. We take new utensils, utensils we acquire from a non-Jew, and we immerse them in the mikvah. Just like a convert, a non-Jew becomes Jewish going in the mikvah, Similarly, or so too, non-Jewish utensils become Jewish utensils by undergoing a conversion by going to the mikvah. Tfilas kalim, tfilas kalim. What's the reason for this? Why? I understand the individual. It's the beautiful significance and symbolism of going to the mikvah. The mikvah, the water represents the embryonic fluid. The mikvah is the womb. The person who immerses is as naked as the day where they are born. There is no barrier. There's no interference. They are like a newborn baby. When they go inside that water and assume the fetal position and cannot breathe for a moment, life is suspended. And when a person is born from that mikvah, from that uterus, and they come out of that embryonic fluid of that natural water that is a necessary part of a mikvah, and they unravel from the fetal position which they were in, and they have no barrier, just like a newborn baby, then a person is born again. So someone who is impure and becomes pure, somebody who had contact with death, somebody who had contact with failing to... Um, conceive or fertilize life, 
Uh, somebody who went from being a non-Jew to a Jew undergoes that transformation where? In the mikvah. I get it. But why kalim? Why utensils? What is the idea of putting our utensils? So listen to what the Me'iri writes. He says, He says, the Me'iri, the Tefillah's Kalim is all about elevating the food. That a Jew has an attitude, a different attitude to food than the rest of the world. The rest of the world can see food as the ends, we see it as a means. For us, the food is simply, it's fuel. The few food is what we put into our system so our system, our engine can run and we can make a difference. The Pnini Halacha, Rav Malamed, Rav Eliezer Malamed writes, Borosh Yeshkan in Achel Gamri, Hanogel Musag HaAmoksha Kedusha Sa'achila. We're talking about an altogether different idea, something that's talking about the holiness of eating. According to the Torah, the way a Jew eats has to be different than a non-Jew. I don't mean utensils, and I don't mean the rules of the courtesy. I don't even mean the rules of kashrus. When we eat, we're not indulging in impulse and instinct, the drive, a desire, and appetite. And we're not simply trying to stay alive another day, stay alive a little bit longer. Eating for us is a religious, spiritual act. In order to have the energy to do good deeds. So we immerse our utensils because in fact, there is a conversion taking place. The conversion is from non-kosher, non-Jewish utensils to Jewish utensils, from a non-Jewish attitude towards eating towards a Jewish attitude towards eating. That's what's happening when we undergo the conversion of our utensils. Tefillah's Kalim is all about saying, in my kitchen, all these appliances, in my kitchen, all these utensils, pots and pans, in my kitchen, all this cutlery, the way I cook, the way I prepare, and the way I eat, I'm not doing it as an animal. And I'm not doing it simply to prolong my life another day out of necessity or survival. I am eating as a religious act. I am eating because in Kedusha El Bemakam Suda, these are Jewish utensils, and this is a Jewish mentality and attitude towards eating. And I have a Jewish ambition that in Kedusha El Bemakam Suda, that I will attain holiness in the way I eat, that I will walk away from a meal not feeling disgusting or gross, or I have to loosen my belt, not feeling that I became more of an animal, but I'll walk away from every meal feeling disciplined that I became more in contact with my godly soul, my godly spirit, that my battle, my daily grind over lechem, melchama, neged sorai, opposite my enemy, that I'm winning. I'm winning. I can enjoy food. I can eat good food. I can eat delicious food, but in quantities and measures at times of the day in ways which will drive my engine, not make it, not undermine it, not compromise it, not sabotage it, not make it get ruined. Now I want to share with you for the last few minutes that we have left insights from Rav, uh, Rav Itcha Meyer Morgenstern, Rav Yitzchak Meyer Morgenstern, the great Rav Itcha Meyer and his wonderful Sefer Bayam Derachacha. We're learning the Sefer on Wednesday mornings in Living with Amuna. You can catch up on the uh, 203 episodes of Living with Amuna on a podcast player, from Gobri.org. And we're learning Bayam Derachacha now in Bittel, what it means to nullify ourselves, submit and surrender, to live with humility. But he has a wonderful, wonderful chapter on Achila. He has a wonderful chapter on the idea of eating. The idea of eating. And he says when it comes to eating, eating is different than all of the taiva. Every other desire, every other appetite that we're trying to be disciplined over, you could live without. You could live without. If you never gossip, it's a wonderful way to live. If you never look at images that you're not supposed to look at, it's a wonderful way to live. But nobody could live without eating. By definition, you need to eat in order to live. So t- eating is the taiva. Eating is the desire or the drive, which is universal. It's just unavoidable. You have to engage it. And that's why it's so, so important to have a proper and a philosophical, and a, uh, a proper and an elevated philosophy of eating, not just to eat with momentum, not just to eat without thinking, not just to eat mindlessly, not to wake up later in life and find ourselves unhealthy, but to eat with intention. And so what is this attitude? He writes the following. I'm just going to read. It's a beautiful couple of chapters of Prakam. We don't have time to read the whole thing. I'm just going to take a couple of selections and communicate to you what I think are his very, very deep, profound ideas. He says, You know, so we were designed, we were programmed. The way the Almighty created the world is we need to eat in order to live. And what happens when we don't eat? Think about a fast day. You don't eat for an entire fast day and you feel weak. The less you eat, the less you drink, the more malnourished, the more dehydrated we are, the more weak we feel. The deeper idea here is 
When we see food, don't see food. When you see food, see survival. When you see food, see your life source. Now we know that we only exist out of the graciousness of God. We're only here because He wills it. If a Kodesh Baruch of the Almighty was not okay with our continuing to be here, we would not be here. We're only here because He wills it. And the way that His will turns into reality is through food. When we eat, our life is extended. That means to say that Hashem sent food our way as a spark, as a spark. The nitsotsos are the oros ketanim, the small light or the spark that is contained within every morsel and every ounce of food is sustenance, is life force, is life source. What makes that food from cardboard? How is the food not just a piece of cardboard? How is the food not just a rock or soil? What makes the food able to sustain us and nourish us? Because there's a soul, a spark, there's a light of God inside it. It's cloaked, it's dressed in the food. So if you say, what's that? That's food. But if you think, what is inside that food? What is sustaining, what is nourishing us, what is extending our lives? There is a spark of godliness, a spark of holiness. So when we eat, what's the intention? What's the thought? What's the mindful idea, the meditation that we should have when we begin to eat? This is a direct connection to God. It is a direct connection to God. If I stop eating, I'll die. And if I eat, I can live. And who gave that food the capacity for it to enable me to continue to live? God. So when I eat, I have engaged a gift from God. I have engaged the very mechanism, the very tool, the very instrument that God has given in order for me to live. You are in fact, you are in fact imbibing, you are in fact absorbing, you are in fact taking into your system, integrating into our very being this light, this spark of godliness, of holiness through that act of eating, through that act of eating. So that's this battle. The animal in us says, be in the here and now and indulge your animal appetite. And don't think about God and don't think about discipline. Just do what you want. Feel disconnected from it. You don't need him. It's your hard work. It's your ingenuity. It's your toil. It's your struggle. You earn the income. You paid for this food. Enjoy it. Be disconnected from him. And therefore, there's a milchama within Lechem. There's a battle. Because our mission is not to be disconnected from him, is not to arrogantly think we earned it without him, but is exactly the opposite. That through that food to realize, Hashem, I have access to this food, it's a gift from you to me. And when I eat it, I am absorbing into myself, I'm integrating into myself a piece of you, a connection with you, a gift from you. Abu Dosenu, our mission, our work is what we see with our eyes. I think the food has its own taste. I think the food has its own texture, and I think the food has its own life-extending capability, but I'm wrong. Ha-MSE, the truth is, that really, the capacity for food to nourish, the fact that it has nutrients, the fact that it extends our life, is the light of Hashem. It's covered. It's covered by its texture. It's covered by its flavor profile. It's covered by its ingredients and its recipe. It's covered by its taste. But its ability to extend my life, the core value and purpose of food, that is the spark, that is the light of Hashem. And when I pause and when I think and when I'm mindful, when I begin each act of eating and I remember that this is in fact contact with the divine. I didn't earn it on my own, it's only because of Him. And that it doesn't give me a sense of arrogance, it should give me a sense of humility. Eating should leave us feeling closer to God, more connected, more grateful, more appreciative. But if we don't use it for that reason, in that way, is the opposite. It becomes a cause to forget God. We're stuffing our face, or we're on too many lachayims, or we're just giving into that appetite beyond what's good for us, what's harmful for us. Not only does it not bring us closer, it drives us further away. And it makes us feel more physical, more further away, instead of feeling more spiritual, more elevated, and closer to Him. So how do we achieve this in our last couple of minutes? How do we get there? How do we get there? How do we get to the place that we stop eating when we're full? that we eat what's good for us and we don't eat what's bad, that we recognize that food is the fuel for our system, that we have the power, we have the will, and we have the free will to express our will power to be godly and not an animal. So it begins, says Rav Meyer, with Iker Kedusha Sachil Anasis, Bekoach HaMachshava. 
it begins not in our stomach, and it doesn't begin in our tongue or our taste buds. It begins in our brain. It begins in our head. It begins in our thoughts. It begins with our mindfulness. We have to be intentional. We have to be present. We have to be mindful. We have to be thoughtful. Because if what we do is we're ravenously hungry and we say, God, shmag, where's God? Who cares about God? I'm hungry. I want to eat that. Versus pausing to think, am I an animal? Or am I a elokim? elokami ma'al mamish? Who do I want to be and how do I want to be thought of? And what is my legacy? And what do I leave behind? And what will I be? What do I take with me into the next world? Is it a life of being an animal, of indulging every appetite, or of expressing discipline, of living with boundaries, of having the capacity to say no, of striving for happiness, or am I striving for holiness? It's the machshava, it's the mindfulness. It's pausing to think. It's pausing to elevate. It's pausing to recognize that I have free will and I have choice and that I can win this battle, and I can ultimately win this war. But it begins with machshava. It begins with my thoughts. It begins with my thoughts to recognize. Every time I eat, I need to attach and I need to connect this benefit, this joy, this pleasure with its source. There's nothing wrong. Don't deny that it tastes good. Don't deny that it's delicious. Don't deny that you enjoy it. Just use all of that to connect it and to attach it and to channel back to its source, Makoro, namely Hashem. Yitzayar la'atzmo, picture shuv v'shuv over and over again. Eich Hashem izborach sholeich litanag ruchni. Hashem is sending me a physical pleasure. Bumislabish li betanag shebepeh. And it's covered, it's cloaked in the enjoyment of the palate. Vani magish oso umisaneg alav. I feel it and I enjoy it, but I'm going to use it and utilize it to connect me above, to connect me to Hashem. That is the machshava. That is the thought. That is the attitude. Says If you want to succeed, Davin, three times a day we take those three steps forward in Rafa'inu and Shmakolainu, whichever bracha you want to add, say, Hashem, help me with my appetite. Help me stop eating when I'm full. Help me live the tainus arrived, leave over a little bit at the end. Help me not eat after a certain time of night or not eat before a certain time of the morning. Help me only eat that which is good for me, not eat any food that is introduced with a negative, with a bracha that tells me it has ingredients I shouldn't be having. We cannot succeed if we don't ask Hashem for help, ask Hashem for discipline, ask Hashem to assist us, number one. Number two, he says, is his boninus. Where do we find that mindfulness? The whole institution of the bracha. That bracha, we say, before we put any food in our mouth, is the opportunity to pause and be mindful. Not only the words, the translation, the comprehension of the bracha itself, but as we say the bracha, to be mindful of our entire attitude and philosophy of eating. Kodesh Baruch Hu. Tarach lefanai shulcha neged sorerai. You've uh, you've set for me a table. It's opposite my enemies. Let me defeat them. Let me eat only what's good for me. Let me elevate. Let me put fuel into my system so I could live my best life yet. And kiddush el b'makom suda and kedusha el b'makom suda. Let me achieve holiness, not just happiness, where I find food. In the lechem, when I'm eating bread and I'm fighting this milchama, this war, let me win. I need your help. We do it with a sense of mindfulness. To please God, never be zolel v'sove. To never, like the Ben Soro Umora, be considered somebody who indulges, somebody who's gluttonous, somebody who drinks too much, that we enjoy the beautiful benefits of life, but we use them as a platform to bring us and draw us closer to Hashem, not chalila, to push us further away. To recognize, to recognize that we have a tzalem alokim, we have a godly soul. And so be determined, this Elul, be determined to take upon yourself if not the Tainas Haraivit, even for the rest of Elul, if not the Tainas Haraivit, the fast, to not have to finish everything on our plate or to not eat after a certain time of night, make a pledge, make a promise, make a resolution, create accountability partners who will hold you in check. But most of all, it begins when we flip that switch. Most of all, it begins when we change that attitude, when we recognize I don't have to indulge the animal. I have a godly soul, a godly spirit. I am capable of expressing free will and will power. And in so doing, please God, we will live our best selves. Wishing you a wonderful evening. Stay happy, stay healthy, and stay holy.